Praise the Lord. Yeah, amen and amen. So, um, yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. Amen. amen. So we we began is a um, you know a a series last Sunday on the tabernacle. Amen. amen. And we and we um, we we understood from last <laughs> Sunday that this thing has an application to our lives. You know, even even today, and it has. Um, um, you know, um, it, 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 the, the tabernacle and all its structures. Uh, in fact, the whole structure of the building of the of the of the thing itself, and even the the furnitures in it, they represent different experiences of our spiritual work with God. Amen. So, and as we begin to as we begin to consider these things and understand it, we can begin to draw life. You know, out of it, it will just go beyond things we read or something that may look a bit uh, complicated. But we will begin to work in each of these experiences. Amen and amen. So today, actually, today, actually, we want to deal with this first structure here, uh, here which is the brazen altar, which is what we have in the beginning of the of the outline. You know, and when you come into the Tabernacle courtyard from the gate. That is the first thing. So when the guilty Israelites, the um, you know all um, uh, uh, um, guilt of sin, you know, and so on. Once they come into that gate, the first thing they see is actually kind of a scary sight. Amen. It's uh, yeah. It, 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 they see the the elevated altar, you know, and we smoke coming out of it. Amen. And, and um, uh, um, all manner of uh, animals are slain there and burnt and offered up to God. Amen. So this, um, the, the instruction for the building of this brazen altar can be found in Exodus chapter 27. This, although we will read, but Exodus chapter 27 verse 1 to verse 8, you know, where the Lord gave Moses instruction. And in that verse 8, at the end, he said, do it as it was shown to you on the mount. So according to the pattern, these things we see here are according to the pattern of things in the heavens. Yes. They are according to the pattern of things in the heavens. So the Lord is just relating it to us so that we can, you know, begin to uh, bring it into practice in our life. Amen and amen. So this structure that we are about to talk about is actually a, is a very, very, very important and key. In fact, it is the foundation to anything that we can ever amount to spiritually. And if we don't get this place right, there is a problem. Because when there is a problem with the, with the foundation, then there is a huge, a, huge, a huge problem. I heard that in engineering, if there is a problem with the foundation, they have to take the whole building down. You know, they would, they would demolish the whole structure. So we must really consider this. So we'll just go with describing the altar, you know, and it is called the, the brazen altar. And in this, this place is where all the offerings and sacrifices are made to God. Everything is made on this, um, on this altar. All the offerings for sin, the peace offering, uh, all of them, burnt offering, they are made on, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the altar of burnt offering. On, it's also called the altar of burnt offering or the brazen altar. Amen. And the brazen altar, you know, or bronze altar, it's called brazen altar because it is made of bronze. You know, uh, the brazen altar or, or bronze altar or altar of, of sacrifice is located, as you can see, right inside the courtyard upon entering the gate. So once you come into that food, that is the first thing that you have to deal with. And the brazen altar stood at an elevated position, raised on a mound of earth, you know, uh, higher than its, its, its surrounding uh, furniture. And it is projecting Jesus, the sacrifice hanging on, 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 on the cross. His altar stood on a hill called Golgotha. 
So basically, this brazen altar is it. It is a figure of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And it is a place. In fact, one one major things one major thing that happens in the Braz, in the brazen altar is that it is a place of slain and it is also a place of offerings and it was on the cross that Jesus Christ offered himself you know for our sins amen now the uh, sorry Belgium, but as we go on we will get more clear amen the brazen altar which is sometimes called the altar of bond offering is symbolic of Calvary the Calvary within the human heart the brazen altar is made up of wood from, from the acacia tree and overlain with bronze. It's, it's, it's made up of wood. This structure that we see here is made up of wood, but it is now overlain with bronze. Before we begin to go into it, I'm just giving us a description of this, of this thing, of this structure. You know? And we know that bronze speaks of judgment. Amen. Bronze speaks of, 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 um, yeah, of, of, of justice. And judgment. So it's made of wood. Mm -hmm. Then it's covered with bronze. Then overlain with bronze. Yeah. And wood makes what? Wood. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Humanity. Wood humanity. Human, humanity. Yes. Uh, and it's overlain with bronze. <clears throat> the brazen altar also has, as you can see on this structure, it has four horns. Checking out. There are four horns on that um, uh, uh, on that altar, pointing pointing out of each corner. The entire altar which with its horns was all overlain with brass. The whole structure, everything about the brazen altar is overlain with brass. So brethren, as we know, you know, um, again, that bronze, that brass, bronze speaks of judgment. Speaks of all manner of ju judgment to anything you know, that does not stand for Christ or judgment to anything, to any nature that does not um, reconcile with the nature of, of Jesus Christ. Like I, like I promised, we are going to get more clear as we, uh, as we go there. So we have seen that once we enter into this tabernacle courtyard, imagine the guilty um, um, Israelites coming in, the first thing that they see is the first thing they behold is that is that altar uh -huh, you know and this brazen altar is an experience that we have to pass through as christians and the altar is it it it, 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 it is elevated it has four horns shooking out and they are all they, they are um they, they are also more details of its construction you know which which uh, we won't touch now amen so the brazen altar is where all sacrifices and offerings are performed, you know, and it is the foundation of everything and anything that we can ever amount to in God. Let us note, this basin altar is the foundation of anything we can ever amount to in, in God. Because the brazen altar speaks of the cross. It speaks of the death and it also speaks of the, even the blood of Jesus Christ. Today, we were singing and we said, we come into your temple. We enter your tabernacle. We just want to be with you, Lord. I don't know if we know that song. It now says, we stand where upon your altar with only ourselves to offer. Amen. The brazen altar speaks of the cross. Now, it's an altar of offerings. Jesus performed the greatest offering on that altar where he offered his, himself on the cross, you know, to win victory and salvation and redemption for, for each and every one of us. So, basically, brethren, the work of Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ came to die for us, but not only to die for us, but he also came to lead us unto life. So, the things that Jesus Christ did, Jesus came to give us a blueprint, or basically, Jesus Christ came to show us a way for us to come unto him. That is why, in fact, the name that we are called Christians, it simply means like Christ, or we are followers of Christ. The disciples of Jesus Christ, they were followers of him. So basically what we are doing here, brethren, in this work, it is do as I do. You know, as Jesus does, we have to do. 
So if Jesus, if we want to enjoy a, a life of, of victory, you know, victory over sin, victory over, every, you know, victory over sin, and so on and so forth, which speaks of resurrection, you know, that means that we must also partake in the death of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Jesus said that if any man should come after me, let him carry his cross, yes. you know, and follow me. So the cross is a symbol of death. So Jesus Christ is simply telling you, you to take your, uh, um, you know, your uh, cross. As I gave up myself on the cross, you have to do the same to come after me. But it's not about our strength, but the Lord's grace, which we will see, is going to help us. So in fact, the Brazen altar is a continuous reference point throughout our journey in, yes. in, in Christ. Yes. The Brazen altar is a, con we must always make reference to the Brazen altar. Even if you come to this place, yes. you must make reference to the blood. In fact, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that enables you to even, to, to even uh, have access. So it is a continuous reference point because everything that we amount to, anything, any height that we are going to in Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ is the is the is the is the reference. It says that we are justified, you know, by faith in, in, in the martyrdom of Jesus. Amen. And um, because of the work of the brazen altar, you and I are alive today. And because of the work of the brazen altar, you and I can face any challenge or circumstance that comes our way now and even forevermore. You know, and uh, there's something interesting Paul says in Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And if we want to pause and begin to examine that, what does it, it doesn't make sense for a sacrifice to be living because a sacrifice is something that is killed, you know. So Paul says, present in Romans 12, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, uh, you know, um, uh, um, um, unto God, which is your reasonable uh, service. So as we partake in this death of Jesus Christ, we are, we are experiencing the death of the flesh and the death of anything that is not of the of the nature of Christ but in that death we are also experiencing life because in the death of Jesus Christ life sprouted forth amen, amen. Jesus Christ was the first person to ever resurrect from the dead mind you laying hands on somebody and raising somebody up from the dead it's not the same thing as resurrection. Mm -hmm. Lazarus was raised up from the dead, you know, but he died back again. Did he die? Is is where are we seeing brother Lazarus around here? The guy died, you know. So, um, <laughs> resurrection is eternal. It is of an eternal nature. It does not. It it is an endless season of life. It says Jesus Christ is now our high priest after the power of an endless life. His the the the. His life is, end, is endless. Eternal life means life over and like the life has no end and has no bounds. And eternal life can only be found in Jesus Christ. The philosophers, the mystics, they have tried to, they have been thinking to see how they can make man live forever. I even understand that uh, this, this scientist, Isaac Newton, spent, spent a huge part of his life studying a field called alchemy. And in that alchemy, they are looking for one stone. They call it the, the philosopher's stone. And this stone can do two things. The stone can turn metal. Just, uh, it, it can turn any metal into gold or silver. That's one thing this stone can do, the philosopher's stone. And another thing that it can do is that it is also an ecclesia of life. It means it can also make somebody to live forever. And Isaac Newton spent a huge part, like even when he was dying, I, wonder, I was watching it on Discovery Channel, that he actually burnt all his work on uh, alchemy. So they are looking for ways, you know, that they can harness this, this life, you know, this, this uh, eternal life. But it is only found in Jesus Christ. Because where is any, among all the gods, all the gods we know, even Allah, Buddha, all of them, where is any of them that resurrected? We, we, we no, not any. You know, it was only Jesus Christ that resurrected from the dead. So the Brazen altar is what makes us holy. 
you know, as the Lord decrees in. Let, read Exodus 29, verse, verse 37. The brazen altar is what makes us holy. It's what, it's what gives us, uh, you know, g- uh, makes us to begin to live the holy life. Exodus chapter 29. Exodus 29, verse uh, 37. Ex- verse 37. And he says, Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar. This word atonement is something that we would talk about. Thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it. And it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. Anything that touches the altar shall be holy. Praise the name of the Lord. So the present altar is what makes us, uh, you know, is what is it's what burns every sinful nature in us and makes us holy. Amen. Amen. So, we should note that in our journey in Christ, one can never say, please put, put, put back that uh, image, one can never say, I have completely passed and outgrown a particular stage or, 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 or level. You know, so basically, we know that, sorry, we know that in this, we said that all these things, they represent different experiences. So no, nobody can ever say, I have finished with this experience. I don't have anything to do with it again, so I'm going here. Because remember that our beginning point is here, and our ending point is, is, is here, you know? So one can never say, it, 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 uh, like, I've, I've finished with this class, so I'm going here, and I've finished with here, I'm going here, and, and so on and so forth. But, okay, I'll, 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 I'll just read. In our journey with Christ, one can never say I have completely outgrown a particular stage or level. For example, I have outgrown the stage of the brazen, uh, of the brazen altar. No. What takes us from one stage to another is maturity in a certain stage. So as we have come into maturity in a, a certain stage, we begin to experience another, but not letting go of the old one. You know that we have experienced, so that at the end of the day, we will be masters, fully matured men and women in each and every one of these stages, that we can reference to every one of them in order to break through unto the fullness. Amen. Amen. So we have to be masters of each and every one for us to launch forth inside here. Yeah. Praise the, the name of the Lord. So there is no uh, a way that you can say I'm done with this experience, that one is now, you know, it's now junior, and I'm now moving f- f- um, um, f- forward to the next. So, however, however, the brazen altar is a perpetual reference point. It is the foundation, and we must painstakingly deal with this part if we are, if we are serious with, with uh, uh, our lives. So the, the brazen altar is a perpetual reference point in any stage that we are in, if be it hearing f- 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 from uh, God. We have the right to hear from God or to be led by the Holy Spirit because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Look at something very in- in- interesting. It says that when Jesus Christ died, on the, the moment he died on the cross, it says that the veil, this stage, there is a veil, a huge, a huge uh, veil. And I understand that this veil was, is actually, it's a big, it's a big veil, tall, you know, and about three to five inches thick. I'm not sure of the measurement of this veil. Amen. <laughs> but I said it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's quite a, a, you know, a big veil. But immediately Jesus Christ died, it says that that veil was parted in two from top to to, to uh, bottom. And Paul said in Hebrews that that shows that the way into the Holy of Holies was now made known to us. But this was an experience that happened in the brazen altar and it had effects. It granted us entrance straight there. So that shows how important this is. The effect of here granted access. So Jesus' death on the cross parted the veil and we have access to come into the very presence of God, you know, so that is the power of what the cross, the death of Jesus Christ does. It says that except, the Bible says that except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, that it abides alone, but when it dies, it sprouts. Amen. 
<laughs> Even the seed, we, we see the beautiful apple, the beautiful sh strawberry that we eat. For that strawberry to become as beautiful as that, it once experienced death inside the ground. Because look at what happens for those of us who did agriculture or who have had some small experience with farming. You know, you know that for a seed to begin to grow, it must have been destroyed in the ground. For it to begin to germinate, that seed must have must have experienced a death. It has been buried. And before it begins to grow, it begins to grow. And then you now see the beautiful strawberry. So many of us want to be strawberry, beautiful, fine strawberry, but we cannot become strawberry if you don't die inside the ground. So there must be a, we must submit ourselves to, to uh, Paul said that I am crucified with Christ. Yet not I that live, but Christ lives in me. Praise uh, uh, God. You know. So the brazen altar is used for all manner of sacrifices and offerings. But we will consider two primary major offerings done on the altar. These two offerings are the burnt offering and also the sin offering, which we, we will just, uh, uh, as we begin to uh, speak on, on, uh, on, on Leviticus 16, we would, uh, you know, we would expand on that. But all manner of sacrifices are done and offerings are done on this uh, 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 brazen altar. But these two offerings, okay, but we will uh, speak about two primary um, offerings that are done there, which is the burnt offering and the sin offering. And these two offerings, are, okay, yeah, are the burnt offering and the sin offering. Actually, they are both two offerings are required to be done at the same time. In that where one is done, the other must also be done. So where the sin offering is done, the burnt offering must also be done. Let's read Leviticus chapter 6, verse 25. Leviticus 6, 25. While you're waiting to go there, please, um, you said that, you know, you talked about the analogy of us dying. Can you just shed some light to, you know, what that means? So that yeah. We are going to expand it. We would, like I said, we will get clear as uh, as we just go forward. We will just and we will also discuss. So we will get clear and discuss. He says, "Speak unto Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. Amen. Amen. So where the burnt offering is performed, the sin offering is also performed. And we are going to understand what these things mean. What is offering? Is it Jesus Christ's death was an offering. He offered his soul. He, he, he offered himself unto death. He, uh, sorry, unto God. You know, yeah, by dying for us. Amen. So, amen. amen. So, um, we, if we also read Leviticus 9 verse 7, we would also see that. So, I said... When talking about this brazen altar, we'll talk about the brazen altar. We'll talk about these two offerings because it is an altar of offering. So we'll talk about briefly these two offerings. And lastly, we will also consider a day called, I'm the one that added great here, but it is actually called the Day of Atonement. But I like to call it the Great Day of Atonement, which has its foundation in the brazen altar. Amen. So we would, we would understand this very easily. So we will try to talk briefly we will try to briefly talk about the brazen altar, the sin offering, and burnt offering, and the day of uh, atonement. We have to consider these three things to properly understand the work of the brazen altar. Amen. Amen. So let us talk about now the brazen altar and, 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 and Jesus, and also us, how it, it, you know, it represents us, which is where we will now begin to talk about this dying thing. Because actually this dying thing is actually a very serious thing that we have to talk about. Amen. Amen. So the, the tabernacle and its surrounding courtyard were enclosed by a fence. You see, all these things here is all a fence. They are all fences. So this is the courtyard of the of the of the um, of the tabernacle structure and we also know that this thing this this structure is where the lord dwells and the lord told moses when he was building the the uh, the tabernacle he said make me a place that i may dwell among you among you if you look at the last diagram here in this our thing this shows you how the israelites were encamped you have the tabernacle in the center, you know, and then you have the, 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 the Levites. Now, the tribe of Levi, 
they were the ones that were given the, the, the responsibility of taking care of this tabernacle and the altar and everything inside it. They were called the tribe of, 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 of Levi. And these guys were performing their role in the priestly office. Amen. So this tribe, they were the ones that surrounded the tabernacle. And then we have other camps, the camp of Dan, the camp of Ephraim, and, and, and so on and so forth. These are all the 12 tribes of, of Israel, but the tabernacle was in the center of them. So it shows that when the Lord said that, make me a place that I may dwell amongst you, the Lord meant business, amen. And that, that, that he meant that the Lord as a church, as individuals, the Lord uh, is to dwell amongst us, within us. Mm -hmm. And as a church, the Lord is to dwell am amongst us. And that is where all the center of direction and leading comes from him. Amen and amen. So, yeah, so um, we can see, as I was saying, that the tabernacle and its surrounding courtyard were enclosed by a fence of heavy uh, curtains, according to Exodus 38, verse 1. The fence around the center of worship was seven and a half feet high, you know, and 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 uh, uh, so so basically, this showed that Jesus is the way into into the tabernacle. Amen. So uh, as uh, Jesus is the way, is the entrance, the gate into the the um, into the structure, into the, the the courtyard of the tabernacle. The rest. In here, 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 on the north or south, you know, and the east, there is no way. There's only one. There's only one door. door there's only one gate. You know, uh, rather into into Christ. So God's pattern of the tabernacle provided an opening for sinful man to approach a holy God. So God has provided Jesus Christ, the only gate through which we may approach Him. You find that in John 14, Acts 4, you know. So Jesus Christ is the only gate through which we can uh, approach him. Now, the various, animal, the various animal sacrifices of the Old Testament were offered on this brazen altar. Although those sacrifices could not take away sin, as Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 to 12 tells us, but they picture the future great sacrifice which could take away sin, which is Jesus Christ. John, John the Baptist said about Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of, 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 you know, of the world. If the brazen altar was able to take away sin, they did burnt offering, sin offering, and so many things there. If the brazen altar was able to take away sins, then there would have been no need for Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ came years, years after all these things. You know, and John said, Behold the Lamb of God. So was he trying to say all the lamb that they were killing there, even the one Abraham killed, which is a figure of this thing, you know, and so many, and, and so many other offerings, the one Noah, the no, uh, offering that, that Noah offered after the flood, and so on and so forth, you know. So he says, but this is the lamb who take care the sins of the world. So everything was just beauty, just a show. It's, it's basically prophecy. They, they were prophetic figures that were pointing to the true and real one that we were all waiting for, which our eyes have been, have been able, have been privileged to see today. Amen. So, all the work connected with the altar of bonds offering typified the work connected with the destruction of sin. For sin separates us from God. We see that in Isaiah 59 verse 2. All the work that we are going to consider in the brazen altar is talks about a separation from sin. You know, now, beyond the brazen altar, please just go very briefly to that structure. Brethren, you know that beyond this brazen altar, nobody, nobody had the right to proceed beyond the brazen altar except the priest. So it was only the priest that had the right to proceed beyond the brazen altar. No other man had the right to proceed beyond the brazen altar. So as we come to the Lord and as we experience this effect, we come in here sinners guilty with all manner of things, you know. But as we proceed out of here, we become priests. It's like a 
manufacturing, you know, uh, you know, like something that the, as you just pass through the thing, you come in a sinner and you come out a priest. Amen. Amen. So this is not is in the scripture. First Peter, the Bible says that it says we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And it says that Jesus Christ, in fact, the one I like is Revelation, it says he has made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. Amen. So it says that Jesus Christ redeemed us by his blood. And by reason of his blood, he has made us kings and priests. Amen. So each and every one of us here are priests of the Most Hallelujah. High God. Amen. So as we, as, we, as we begin to, you know, as our consciousness begins to awake, awaken to this. Amen. So the horns of the brazen altar, which we saw, it has four horns. The horns of the brazen altar speak of the saving strength of Jesus. Yes. Look at Psalm 18, verse 2. David called Jesus Christ the horn of my salvation. Yes. Look at uh, Psalm 18, verse 2. You may not need to... Okay, Psalm 18, verse 2. He says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation. Amen. So they, when they want to sacrifice, they take the animal and they tie it to the horns. The horns of the other speaks of the saving strength of Jesus Christ. That's why I said it's not by our works. It is by the strength of the Lord. Amen. What we have to do is to come upon, is to come and submit ourselves in the altar. Amen. And the experience of the altar has only been made available for us by the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you look at Psalm 1, um, uh, Psalm 1, 18. I'll, and I'll just read from verse um, the brazen look, when we come into when we come into the brazen altar we are talking about a transition into life. Amen. But okay I can just read there are so many beautiful things to read in this Psalm 118 but I can just read from verse uh, 20 or, or maybe I can read from uh, okay from verse 19 Verse 19 says, open to me the gates of, of, of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He says, um, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and I become my word, my salvation. This, as we open the gates and, and, we, and we approach unto him, and that has become my salvation. He now says, the stone which the builders re refused is become the head of the corner. This stone is talking about Jesus Christ. He is that rock. David called him his rock. He said, the Lord is my rock. Amen and amen. amen. And uh, even the Bible also tells us that the rock in which Moses struck, you know, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were testing and they began to cry and the Lord told, told Moses to touch the rock and, and, uh, and, and life will comfort, which is Water, you know, will comfort. And, and Moses smote it. In fact, that was the thing that actually prevented him from coming into the, the, uh, the promised land. Because he smote God. So that rock was Christ. And we also sing about standing on the rock, which is Christ. So it says, this stone which the builders refused, which they took and crucified and said, you are not the, the Messiah that is to come and so on and so forth. He says, the stone which the builders rejected is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our sight. He, David now looks in the spirit and says, I don't know if it's David, I haven't wrote this Psalm 118, used to check. But the writer now says, this is the day which the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. This is the, it's not this day that we are talking about. It's not 24 hour day. This is the, the it's talking about an era. You know, it's talking about a dispensation of time. There's no time for us to go. I would have showed us the ushering in of this day. Maybe we should do it in Luke. In Luke chapter, it, in fact, it was first shown in Isaiah, and then it was shown in Luke also. You know, how this day was, was, was brought forth, you know, upon us. But David made, makes reference to that and says, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. He says, save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed ye, we have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords 
even where to the horns of the altar. Take the sacrifice, which is exactly what they do, and bind it with cords, with rope, to the horns of the altar. Amen. That a work of purifying, you know, can begin to be done, with which we would make ourselves more clear. Amen. So, Jesus Christ is typified as the priest. Now, remember, the Israelites will bring their animals inside. They will bring the, the animals, what, the animal that they want to use for, for sacrifice, and they give it to the priest. Now, Jesus Christ is typified as the priest who takes the blood of the sacrifice right into the holy place and to the holy of holies to make atonement for us. I pray, I don't know if we have time. This, I wish we can, because I want us to discuss more before we talk about this day of atonement. Because when we talk about this day of atonement, we will actually open up. We would, I, I, I really trust and I believe that we would, we would just get a very full understanding of this, of the work of this present order. But basically when the, um, you know, the, um, yeah. So Jesus Christ, sorry for not being too clear right now, is also typified as the priest who takes the blood of, of our sacrifice, he takes it to go and make atonement in the holy place and in the holy of holies for us. Amen. Amen. Now, the knife of the priest is the word of God, and the fire is the purification agent to burn everything that speaks of sin. What happens in this brazen altar is death, which births a change, a metamorphosis to a higher form of life. Amen. So what happens in the brazen altar is death, and the beginning of that death begins to, it, 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 it initiates, it initiates a, a, a process in which we are changed into life. Amen. Amen. Now, in order for us to come into life, into the presence of God, we must have to pass through the sword and the fire. In order for us to come into life, we must pass through the sword and the fire. Now, a question which I threw here, which will answer with its implication is, what was used to protect the garden? when God drove Adam and Eve out of it. And where was this thing placed? We know that the Garden of Eden represents the presence of God. And when man fell and God drew, drove him away out of the garden, God did not leave the garden unprotected. He put something to, to protect it. And the answer is that God placed a cherubim and a flaming sword to protect the garden and it was placed at the east of the garden. If you read Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, we see there, Genesis 3, verse 24, it says, <clears throat> So he drove out man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword. It means a sword which was on fire, you know, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So that cherubim and the flaming sword were kept to protect entrance into that place. So, implication. In order for us to march into life, to march into the presence of God, we need to go through the slaying of God's word, which we can find in, in, in reference to that in Hebrews 4 verse, verse 12, and the refining fire of his presence, Malachi 3, Isaiah 4, to purge us from sin, and kill the flesh so that the sweet aroma in us can begin to express just as our burnt offering even jesus christ was amen. amen so what was kept to protect this garden was a flaming sword you know and so that means that if that was the thing that was protecting the entrance into god anyone who is coming into Anyone who is coming into that, that, th that garden of God, that presence of God, must pass through this agent. And that was the same thing that tabernacle, please put that uh, uh, structure. And basically, when anyone is coming from this side, this is the east, as I showed, that, that was supposed to, this diagram is put. It shows you the bearing, north, south, east, west. So you come in from the east, and the, the, the flaming sword, was put where? At the east of the garden. This, uh, this just shows you that this is a, a figure the Lord is trying to show us. It's shown in the east of the garden. And when we, 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 we come in, we meet the Levites, you know, the priests with their knives. And also this place 
is always burning with fire. Amen. Amen. Actually, the fire of this altar must never go out. So there is always fire burning here, we used to burn the the uh, the the sacrifices, and there is also the 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 knives that they use that the priest used to slay the animal. Praise the name of the Lord. So the fire of on the brazen altar was lighted by God Himself. The fire was ignited by the Lord Himself in Levit Leviticus chapter nine verse uh, um, verse twenty four. Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24 says, And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell to their faces. So fire came from heaven. No man put the fire on the brazen altar. When he set up, I don't know, maybe they prayed or whatever, and fire came from heaven and ignited that thing. And that is this, that same fire they would take the fire, they will take the coals from the fire and go and light uh, the altar of incense inside the, the holy place. That fire is called holy fire. You know, it's fire ignited by, by the Lord, which is also that same fire that the Lord has put inside every one of us that is awakening us to, to, um, to salvation and also awakening us to the consciousness of God. So that means that we have no hand in our salvation. The fire was ignited by God. We have no hand in our salvation. Therefore, every arm of flesh must die so that the grace of God can fully express itself in us. And once, and once it is kicked in, it is eternal. It never goes out. Amen. So, it says in Adam, all died. Like we said uh, last Sunday. None of us here, who can say uh, that uh, you had a hand in the sin of Adam? It says in Adam, all died. That's what the Bible says. We, we had no, no place. We did not partake in the sin of Adam. It now says, but also in Jesus Christ, all are made alive. Amen. So the same way we had no hand in the sin of Adam, you know, to be subject unto sin and death, also we have no hand to come into life. In Jesus Christ, all are made, are, are, are made alive. So as we put our trust in him and begin to follow as he leads, which are all the things that he, that he is, is showing us, we are, are, are awakened unto life. Amen. Amen. So what this blessing altar means to us, virgin, is talking about, like I said, is speaking about the Lord. Now the lamb that is brought to sacrifice, Jesus Christ is the lamb of God that takes the, the sins of the world. So it's, it's brought to, to be uh, sacrificed upon that altar, which, is, which represents the cross, therefore bringing us life. But so also ourselves, because Jesus Christ said, maybe we, we won't have been talking about this, but Jesus said that if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. And Paul says in Galatians 2, verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ, yet not I, I live. Please, let's be, uh, put Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Amen. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, we also are to be crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ, which we are going to discuss now briefly. And after that, after we discuss, we will see, because if we can talk about this day of atonement. But we also are supposed to be crucified, you know, with, uh, um, 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 uh, with the Lord. So, just as Jesus Christ also represented that animal, there is something called the sin offering. And in the sin offering, what there is to offer is a bull. And that bull represents our sin, sin life. So they would drag, sorry, a bullock rather, a young bull. He must be male. And they would drag that bull to the altar. It's just like the same dragging our sin and just struggling for its life. Struggling. The flesh struggles to keep itself, uh, you, you, you know, alive. It makes its desires. That bull struggling and struggling and at the end of it is tied to the altar and it is slain and it is burnt. Praise the name of the Lord. Another thing that these priests do, which we will see in Leviticus 16, as we talk about, they will take the blood of that, uh, that animal and they will pour it to the base, you know, of the altar. That they will pour it right to the foundation, you know, that the blood reaches every, the, the deep, every part of us down to the foundation. The blood addresses every part of us, you know. Praise uh, the name of the Lord. Now, so we see that 
in summary now, this brazen altar is a place of crucifixion. Hallelujah. We have to be crucified. And what are we crucifying? There are five things that the cross crucifies. The cross speaks of crucifixion. The cross speaks of death. If anybody must follow Jesus, you must take your cross and follow him. Jesus Christ was crucified on, an eleva on a hill, you know, and the whole world saw, saw the cross, Jesus Christ being crucified. This brazen altar, when you enter, it is in an elevated position, just signifying the cross of Christ. The five things that the Bible crucifies is our sin. It crucifies the self, itself. it crucifies sin, it crucifies self, it crucifies the flesh, it crucifies the world, and it crucifies the rudiments of the world. The Bible crucifies sin. Let us look at Romans 6, verse 6. Romans 5, 10. So when we talk about this crucifixion, dying, crucifixion is death. So what, when we say that, what are we to die to? What are we to die to? What are, when, if we are to experience this brazen lava, sorry, altar, sorry. The cross crucifies our sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. It says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might what might be destroyed, that henceforth we should no longer serve sin. Go to verse 11 of this. Verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Remember, we say this person altar speaks of death, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Though dead to sin, but alive unto God. Another thing that the Brazilian altar crucified, that crucifixion does, is crucifies self. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, the one that we just read. Galatians 2, 20. It says, I am crucified. I, yourself, I am crucified with Christ. And nevertheless, I live, but Christ liveth in me. And then, so we see, even this crucifixion, crucifixion speaks of death. But we see that each place it talks about crucifixion is like a Paradox, life is now uh, uh, spoken about. He says, you are crucified, but you are living. He says, nevertheless, I live. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, amen. amen. So, the cross crucifies our sin. It crucifies the self. It crucifies self. The cross crucifies the flesh. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Galatians 5, 24. And they that are Christ have crucified what? The flesh with the affections and the lust. So we have examined three things with scriptural reference that the cross crucifies. When it says, let us be crucified with Christ, we need to know what we are crucifying. Another thing that the cross crucifies is the world. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me. By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Amen. Amen. The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. And the last thing that the cross crucifies is the rudiments of the world. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. So he says, wherefore, if we are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to its ordinances? So we are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. So when Paul now says, I am crucified with Christ, or when Paul talks about dead, uh, dying, Paul says in, in, um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, he says, I die daily. I die daily. It means what you are dying daily to do sin, to self, to the flesh, to the world, and to the rudiments of the world. Amen. Praise the Lord of the Lord. So when, when it says let, let we are crucified with Christ, these are the things that the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ crucifies in us. Amen. And we must take part of this death. We must be in union with the death of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Of his suffering, we must partake in fellowship of his suffering that and also to be conformed unto his death. You know, if we want to be saved, to be just to be saved, you know, to be to be to become a Christian or to obtain salvation, to obtain salvation, all we need to do is to be saved, is to accept Jesus Christ. But to reign in glory. 
to reign in glory, we must suffer. There is no glory without suffering. So to reign is different. So many, so many people accept Jesus Christ as their, as their Savior, but not all accept as the Lord. He said, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Savior is what he has saved you, but Jesus Christ being your, being your Lord, it simply means he has, he's, he's now, I mean, every, he, your, yourself basically has, has been taken, and you take all order and directives from Jesus Christ. He says, these are those that follow the Lamb of God wherever, whithersoever he goeth. So that is Jesus Christ being your Lord. So Jesus Christ being your Lord is, is you know, uh, uh, Jesus being Lord, or having Lordship over our lives, you know, is something very, very key. And without suffering, we cannot partake of glory. So it's, it's simple as we yield ourselves to the sufferings of the cross, to the sufferings of the Lord in this, in this time that we live, then in the time to come, we shall partake of the glory. You, there is no glory without suffering. Amen. So I want us to uh, discuss a little bit now about this issue of dying. You know, and we have been talking about dying, dying, dying. You know, and so on and so forth. So how do we, you know, yeah, just uh, comments at this point. We we saw, uh, or we just mentioned now that five things that have to be crucified in us. We talked about sin the self, self flesh the world and even the rudiments of the world and i wish we can also expatiate a little bit what is this rudiment of the world you know that that we are to submit that we are to be crucified to every day you know so let's discuss how can we effectively submit ourselves to to the work of this brazen altar how can we ex, ex, uh, effectively enjoy the experience of this brazen altar yeah and to this is a very interesting question for us to you know, how can we this dying at this being crucified how can we practically key into the experience of this brazen uh, altar we say that the five things it crucifies sin self the world the flesh the rudiments of the world what is the rudiments of the world you know that we have to be crucified uh, um, 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 onto daily and how can we experience because it's very key to experience this dying, we must we must die to to we must die in order to you know to uh, be effective in the other experiences that the Lord has for us in order for us to come into the entrance of life. Amen. Well, so. the teacher teaching last Thursday in Thursday meeting quoted the uh, thank you the book of John. Uh, you know said. Uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Then she asked the question, can the truth set one free? Truth doesn't set people free. It is the knowledge of the truth that sets us free. Now, as you are ministering this to us, the Lord is opening up our heavens and to those indicating in the spirit and joining the spirit of Christ are being delivered right as this word is being spoken. It's a function of knowledge. And that is why the Bible says in Psalm 105, seek the Lord, seek the Lord, seek his strength. Seek the Lord, seek his strength. So there must be a, a strong desire to seek to seek, to hunger, to want, to desire, to desire the knowledge of God. He said, you shall know the truth. May God help us, help me to know the truth. And the truth shall set me free. All I need is to know it, it will set me free. Amen. Other contributions. Yeah, no, other, other contributions still open. You know. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the altar in terms of its elevation? Chidera said that the brazen altar must be elevated. You know, it is an elevated experience. And when he was saying it, what dropped in my heart is that when we become born again, it is not an experience that people do not see. 
people have to see. That is why the brazen altar is elevated. People have to actually see, oh, this person has changed. This person is born again. There is a new life in this person. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So our experience must be known, must be seen by all. If your experience is not being seen, if your born again experience is not being shown, it's not being shown to the world, then you want to go back and take a look at that foundation. God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So people will know you in your workplace, at your school, that there's a difference in you from, you know, he says, uh, there's, there's those songs we usually sing back in those days, you know, the things I used to do, I do them no more. You know, you, the, the life of God is in worked in you as we experience the, uh, the, the brazen altar, and it is visible, because that experience is, on, is done on an elevated altar. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Just um, narrowing to Chidera's question on how do we um, crucify the flesh? How do we die to the rudiments of the world? How do we die to the world and all of that? Uh, the scripture overtly gives us the key. You know, there's, uh, there was, I listened to a message. I like the title of that message. Expose yourself to the word and receive the change. And we know that the Bible says change comes by the renewing of your mind. Praise the Lord. So the Bible also says in um, 2 Corinthians, we all with unveiled faces, we behold as in a glass. We behold the glass is the word of God. We behold as in a glass the glory of God. And we are changed in the same image from glory to glory. Praise God. Hallelujah. I remember I had an experience one time. And basically in that experience, God actually showed showed me a key and he used someone in person of Auntie Edith and she came to me in that experience and said to the level at which you behold that is how you are changed that means the more you behold the word of God the more you are changed praise the Lord and it comes by a function of your will you must say I strive so let me read Luke um, 13 verse 25 praise the Lord and Kwachu said, it comes with intentionality to seek the Lord in Psalm 105. Seek the Lord and seek his strength. David says, in, I think it's in Psalm 27, he says, when the Lord said, seek my face, my heart responded to him and said, Lord, thy face will I seek. That means, Lord, with intentionality, I make my mind up to seek your face. Praise the Lord. So even though Matthew 7, 7 verse 13 talks about the narrow way and the straight way, Luke 13 actually tells us from verse 24. It says, okay, let me read verse 23. It says, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he now said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. For once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. He shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. So practically, dying to the flesh is striving to enter the narrow gate. I don't want to read another scripture because I know there are many contributions. Second Corinthians 5.15 tells us, that because Christ died for us, I no longer live unto myself, but I live for the one who died for me. We know how difficult it is to die to the flesh. Uncle Hope talked about the distributed effect of the fall. And brethren, when we die, it is not, it is not sweet at all. You are, it's basically self-denial. Praise the Lord. A lot of function, because uh, Romans 6 says, with my mind, I serve the law of God. I yield my members. That means I yield all that is in me. I yield my strength, I yield my emotion, and I yield my will to God. Not my will, but your will. I must decrease and you must increase. So it is by daily striving. You know, uh, C.S. Lewis says there is no neutral ground. There is no such thing as gray areas before God. It is black or it is white, and you must 
make up your mind. And as you do that, you sanctify it by the blood of Jesus. Lord, I receive the blood over the horns of my altar, over the very strength of my life, that with my will, I will choose what is right. Psalm 132, I like it in NIV. David says, Lord, remember David and all his self-denial. That remember David and all of his affliction. And what was the self-denial? David made up his mind. As long as in, I'm, an, I'm in this, my flesh, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until the Lord finds a resting place. And he says, Arise, O God, thou and the ark of my strength. When you do that, it is painful for me to say, Lord, I will not give sleep to my eyes nor slumber to my eyelids until you find a resting place in me. Man, if I, you use your own vices, the thing that pinches you. If I have $12 more, in economics there's a principle. You're only willing to spend for something that you really like. That is what makes demand possible. I have $12 and I want to buy a shoe at Ann Taylor. It means a lot to me because I've matched that shoe with 90 pairs of dresses or 90 uh, dresses in my wardrobe. And somebody asked me for that $12. For somebody, it may not be a big deal. For, for me, it's a super big deal. And you you give that money to that person, something has really died in you. And David is saying, Lord, remember me and this self-discipline. And what was the reward? Is that the Lord will find a resting place in each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, uh, just uh, she raised something which is very touchy. This uh, Luke chapter 13, um, verse 23. I'll read it from NIV, sorry, from um, Amplified. And someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved, delivered from the penalties of the last judgment, and made partakers of the salvation by Christ? And he said to them, Strive to enter by the narrow door. Force yourselves through it. Hallelujah. For many, I tell you, this is the Lord speaking to us, will try to enter and will not be able. And he gave the reason. When once the master of the house gets up and closes the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door again and again, saying, Lord, open to us. He will answer you, I do not know where, what household, certainly not mine, you come from. Now, well, I'm not going into details, but as she was speaking, what struck me was, was this. These people were seekers, but they sought at the wrong time. Now, the key, the relevance is this. There is a dispensation, a dispensation to which this gospel is being preached. Now, the di dispensation, it speaks of time. It speaks of a time when this word is being dispensed. The dispensation, dispensation means it be, it's being dispensed. The period, there's a time when we are hearing this. And that is why we should take advantage of the word now. Because a time will come, the dispensation time will close when Jesus stands up. He said, when the master stands up and shuts the door and says nobody is coming in. Then people will, oh, those things I was hearing, I was, oh my God, they start knocking. The dispensation, that time has closed. So the lesson is this, brethren, to me, in this time where this word is being dispensed, it's called a dispensation to me. I should now begin to do what? Strive to enter. Make all effort to enter and not to put this knowledge in a reservoir. Later I will attend to it. I'm hearing it because God wants to transform my life today. Else I will not be hearing this. 
So it is a privilege that I am hearing it, and it's a privilege to take advantage of the dispensation where this is being dispensed. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. The rudiments of the world. I really want to know what the rudiments of the world is. Yeah. Okay. The rudiments of the world. You know, the, it's 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 um that word rudiment is is English language. You know, and it's to say something about um, if you check when I check the dictionary sometime, it says the elements of first principles. So or the um, uh, the the principles of a subject or the, the foundation, the principles. So basically, the principles that in which the world operates by. Yes. You know, it says we are crucified to the not just the world, but we are crucified to the rudiments, to the principles that the world operates by. When the is children of Israel came into their land, the Bible is tells them. It says, "Do not do as this." People do, you, you know, but you, you shall be, you shall be pe uh, peculiar people, and the way they, their manner of conduct, you know, their their code of conduct is as unto the Lord. So there are so many rudiments. The way we shouldn't be imitators, you know, of the way the world does things. We are a to be a beacon of light, you know, or we are supposed to be a light that is on, uh, uh, that is shining. On, on a hillside. So the world, rather, is supposed to be imitators of us. The Bible says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So the world, we shouldn't be the ones imitating the manner of the manner in which the world does things, you know, but we should uh, uh, operate, you know, on the true, in the, in the way the Lord himself does things. So we can now talk about different examples of, of the rudiments of the world. I mean, we are, we are in this world, although we are not of this world, but we are in the world, however, and we see the rudiments of the world around us, and so many patterns of things in different subject matter, you know, in which the world does things, in which people of the world operate in a particular, uh, uh, in a particular thing, but we shouldn't be of that. We are crucified to those things. If you check that scripture, it says, and uh, are ye subject to to, to ordinances. He says, why as though living in the world? He agreed. We are living in the world. You know, are ye subject to ordinances? You know, praise uh, God. So even though we are living in the world, we shouldn't be subject, we shouldn't be subject Amen. to the ordinances and the principles of the world. And these things are lies. The, these things, yes. look, in the mind, the subconscious is very, very, uh, is very, very serious. You know, because once you, that's why Paul talks, spoke about the renewing of the mind. Because once your mind is renewed, you know, it's, that in it itself is a form of, 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 of salvation. Once the mind is renewed. So we can have different things in our minds, you know, uh, concerning the, uh, the, the rudiments of the world. You know, we can, it, it can be something we believe. Like, personally, I'm not a fan of all those things. You know, somebody will say, this one, oh, this one is a... Uh, is uh, choleric in nature. This one is uh, this one is sanguine, you know. But take personality personality types and be attaching to you, and you now say, okay, so choleric cannot marry, uh, uh, you know, somebody that is is, is choleric. You are so different personality types that the world takes, you know, and and people now believe it. So okay, I am I am I am choleric. So that is how I am. And we see people say, oh, no, you know, just bear with that brother or bear with that sister. That is how he is. That is how she is. But are we not supposed to bear the personality of Jesus Christ? That is the only personality that we, that, that we are to bear. Whether choleric or that choleric must be crucified, you know, and it's the nature of flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So if you, are, you have choleric, you cannot inherit, inherit the kingdom of God. You must be, you must, we have, it says in Revelation, we showed a picture of a people who have been beheaded. It means that they do not have their control anymore with them. Their, their, their head is now Jesus Christ. So our personalities, our natural personalities still has to be shaped, you know, into that of Christ. Because it's only one personality that, that we bear. So that is one way to me of, of crucifying, you know, of being crucified to the rudiments of the world. The things that 
are told, you know, until some of us have just in the mind, you just carry it that, you know, you will die. You know, that death is, is, is you know, is ahead. That death is inevitable. But we are forgetting that death is actually a cause of the fall. If the Lord permits it and wills that we depart this earthly tabernacle or that you depart this, this, this earthly tabernacle, you know, the Lord will reveal it unto you. Because I believe that the Lord reveals on if you are a son of God, the, the Lord does not just, it does not take you like that. The Lord reveals unto one way or the other, you will know that you are going. You go and look at the patriarchs, how they died. They knew they were going, they organized themselves. Even this one that died in a very beautiful way. One of them, you see, is, is Jacob. He had conversation, he even drank tea, lay down, positioned himself. Gave himself the posture that he wants to take to die. <laughs> and everything, you know. I mean, very beautiful. And talk, 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 nice talk, and now just go and just die. You know, in fact, he didn't die. He, he offered his life because the Lord demanded of it. He says, I delight to do thy will, O Lord. So if the will of the Lord is that I depart, then fine. You know, I, you know, I, uh, I depart. But however means the death comes, you know, is that we know about it and we offer up our lives. You know, but also... If the Lord also determines, you know, that we will not all see death, it is also possible. Men in the Old Testament lived, you know, without seeing. It is not only Enoch that did not see death. It's not, you know, if you read that scripture, well, we will see it. I don't know if you have to examine that. It's not only Enoch. There were others before Enoch that did not see death. Enoch was just the example that the Bible used to show us. It's stated there in the Bible. If we go and look at that scripture very well, it was not only Enoch that did not see death. There were others, others before him that did not see, see, that did not experience the physical death. But we will not all die, but we will all be changed. Amen. Praise the, the name of the Lord. Yeah. Um, just to add to crucifying the rudiments of the flesh. Um, the Bible says, first of all, to walk in the spirit, rudiments of the world, sorry. The Bible says, uh, if you live in the spirit, so walk in the spirit, praise the Lord. So I can say, before I walk in the spirit, I need to learn how to live in the spirit, praise the name of the Lord. Living in the spirit, I understand living in the spirit as coming to that place where I leave the scriptures. The word of God leaps from this letter and has become life to me. So, you know, some Benny Hinn shared an experience with a woman who kept confessing, you know, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. I, by stripes, I'm healed. But maybe somebody just told her, if you confess it militantly, you receive your healing. But it didn't work for her. And as he met her, he gave her a word of knowledge. And the word of knowledge was, if you live in the spirit, you will walk in the spirit. This word is not life to you. And by the time he started ministering to her, you know, faith had come into her. And she read that scripture again from Isaiah 53. He was bruised for my transgression. This time she read it with tears. It, the, the word of God had entered into her and she received life. And she said, it, Lord, by your stripes I am. In fact, she said how she received that healing was, she said, Jesus, you carried this cancer on the cross. And there and there, the word of the Lord became life to her and she received that healing. So reading Colossians um, 2 verse 20 in the context that Paul wrote it, people were talking about the regulations of the celebration of the new moons and the Sabbath. Now we can see if we talk about character, you know, psychologists, we have anger management program. There's no such thing as that because man is a beast anywhere. Law and order in government is what keeps man in place. But man is man anywhere. Praise the name of the Lord. So, and if you read this um, Colossians 2.20, I'll read it from NIV. It says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world? Do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. 
These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. It says such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So uh, being crucified to the rudiments of the world is God simply showing us how to live the new creation life. There is no such thing as I can marry a good unbeliever. An unbeliever is an unbeliever. Only in Christ can we learn how to walk the path that he has ordained for us. So we are not constrained or my character is not changed by Maslow's law of self actualization. Maybe I'm having problems with insecurity. I go to a psychologist and she gives me seven steps to be actualized in myself. No. My identity is not in my gifts. It's not in what I have. My identity is because I am a child of God. And that is the way to be crucified to the rudiments of the world. Praise the name of the Lord. Not being governed by the elemental principles of I touch, I feel. Anger management says when you are angry, you leave the room, get a, a position called the comfort position. It's a lie. If the Satan comes upon you, whether you stand in the comfort position, you will kill somebody. But it's only in Christ that you know you slap us and you turn the other cheek. So I understand this rudiment of the world not being subject to elemental principles because the Bible says it has a show of worship. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's spirituality in it, but it does not kill lust. Mm -hmm. It does not kill pride. It does not kill anger. Praise the name of the Lord. So if you live in the spirit, then what? Walk in the spirit. The Bible says if through the spirit, the instrument is the spirit, you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will live. The Bible also says the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. I like to say that again, mighty through God. Whenever I'm praying, I say it is mighty through you. Oh God, this weapon is mighty because I have you. And it's mighty to pull down the stronghold of pride, of arrogance, of lust in my life. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so it is <laughs> liberty for us to finish it. Okay. So we see, I'm wanting to note is that this brazen altar, remember we say bronze speaks of judgment. So it is judgment, it's judgment. The Bible says in, uh, the Bible says in, I wrote that scripture down. I think in, um, one of these scriptures anyway. Wait, I have it here. The Bible says, yeah, Paul basically said, I think that was in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 31. It says that for if you would judge, if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Amen. So this brazen altar, it speaks of, now is the time for judgment. Because in that place is gold. That last structure there is gold. It's, it's, it's perfection. It speaks of majesty. Amen. So we are moving from, judge, from judgment, from justice, unto, unto majesty and perfection. So now is the time. We, as we are living right now, we are being judged. So as we submit ourselves to these dealings, we are judging ourselves, and there will be no need for the Lord to bring any of us to any position and say, oh yeah, this is the book I'm opening, this is what you're judging. No. You say, if we, if we judge ourselves now, all the things that have been given for us to judge ourselves, or all the, all the elements of judgment are given. Jesus Christ, judgment has been committed to the Son, to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is, is, is within us. So the element of judgment is already with us now. Amen. So as we yield and utilize it, judgment is for and the, the sinners are the ones uh, hey, that would appear before white stone and whatever and being judged and so on and so forth. But now is the time for us to, as we, to be, we are constantly, presently being judged every day by the uh, ability of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit within us. So this brazen altar it speaks of judgment. The other one to everything, this altar court is of judgment. This other structure is called the brazen lava. It's a basin with water inside, but it's made of day of atonement. Sorry, before you move on to that, I just want clarification. The brazen altar, is it a place? 
Is it an experience? And I, uh, or is it the person? Or is it both? The brazen altar. The brazen altar and experience? Or is the brazen altar Jesus? So is it is it the what? Or is it the who? Mm -hmm. Is it both? Hallelujah. Do you understand? Yes, this? yes. So Jesus Christ is a person, right? Yes. Jesus Christ is a person, but we experience Jesus. Yes. Amen. So the blessed order is a figure of Jesus himself, mm -hmm. of the cross of the Lord, and is also an experience. Yes. It's something that we have to experience. If Jesus Christ is not in us and we are not experiencing him, then it's is in us and we're not experiencing him, then there is no use, there is no effect, there is, something is not being done. So it's, it is a, it, these things represent Jesus Christ. Each and every one of them, they are figures of him. They are all a, in the ones we are doing in the, in the Old Testament, it's not the original, but Jesus Christ is the original of each and every one of, of these things. So we have to experience this thing. Experience, and it speaks about the blood of Jesus Christ. So anywhere we are going in this place, we must make reference to the blood. The blood is the, ref is the blood that grants us entrance into each and every one of these things. Amen. Amen. So I will just read this then. We now turn to Leviticus 16. But before we turn to Leviticus 16, now I will talk about a day called the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is a very key ministry performed on the brazen altar or it starts, the work starts from the Brazilian altar, basically, that's foundations there. And our understanding of the truths of this day can launch us into a very victorious life in Christ Jesus. When we understand what has been done on that particular day called the Day of Atonement, it is a truth which we must consider and begin to experience. Atonement is derived from the Hebrew word kofa, you know, which means to cover to purge or to make and or to make reconciliation that is what the that is what atonement means to purge to cover cover for sins and to make a to make reconciliation to bring at peace you know to bring two people at to reconcile two people and bring them at peace peace is unity peace is unity now peace is bringing one, bringing us, is to bring us one with Jesus Christ. The Bible says he is our peace who has broken down the middle wall of, 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 you know, of partition and has brought us into union with the Lord, with the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. So to bring at peace, to reconcile us to Christ is not to settle different, it's not only to settle differences, but it's to bring us one, which is what it, one of the things shown in this day of atonement. Atonement is to bring you and I to become one with the Lord. Atonement, you know, most, most co commentators, they will call it at one meant. As, you, as I wrote it there, at one meant, to bring atonement. So when you hear that word, atonement, to make an atonement, to make a, is to bring you one with the Lord Jesus Christ. So to understand this day, we will need to run through Leviticus 16 and comment and discuss briefly as the Spirit permits. So the, the parallel, what was done in Leviticus 16, Paul spoke about it uh, in Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. So brethren, there okay, this is quite random or off, but there remains a rest for the people of God. There is a rest that has been made available for us, as Hebrews 4 verse 9 says. And that rest is available now because this rest that Paul is speaking about was initiated on the day of atonement. Or rather, the day of atonement is a, it shows a figure of the initiation, of the beginning of this rest. When the Bible says there remains a rest for the people uh, 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 of God. Praise the, the name of the Lord. So that is just, what, just to tell us what that word means, atonement. You know, to bring us one with the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we can now turn to Leviticus chapter 16 to just go through it very briefly. And this work at home, it is initiated in the, in the brazen altar. And as we begin to see how this relates to both to Christ and to us, very, very briefly, we'll just uh, run through that. So, Leviticus chapter 16. Now, the Israelites, the sacrifices are always offered on on. On, on uh, other days, you know, they, uh, they have sacrifices for sin, for this one and that one. Now, but on the, please put that figure. On the day of atonement, is a special day. It's, on that day, that, this day of atonement, 
it is it happens only once it happens once every year it's only one time a year it happens and it is on this day of atonement that any human being enters this place because if you if you match this place in fact if you enter this place when it's not the day of atonement you are finished and it's not just anybody that enters it's only one person which is the high priest which is the high priest only the high priest enters that place nobody has the right even if you have two heads to enter inside that place and be alive only the high priest enters the holy of holies on the day and he enters it on the day of atonement and the high priest does not just enter the day of atonement on his, his own anyhow he enters it with blood he takes the blood of the sacrifice into that place praise god now we know that jesus christ is our great high priest now you know so this was a figure of of jesus christ and remember they did this every year every year but as we will see very soon it says that jesus christ did it only once only wants to to gain entrance for us okay let's let's read it Leviticus 16 and verse 1 and the Lord spoke unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord and died the two sons of Aaron anyway they died they died uh, trying to offer incense to the Lord because I don't know what happened maybe somebody slept the fire that they see the Lord says should not go out the fire went out so they went to go and light fire on their own and to offer before the Lord. The Bible said that they offered strange fire and because of that, the Lord slew them. So it must be holy fire. It must be holy fire. Anything that we are giving to the Lord in sacrifice, in offering, whatever we are offering to the Lord must come from a clean conscience. It must be, it must be, it must, it must be, it must be pure, it must be better you know from the lord if we are doing it that man should see or you know for another form of glory it is called strange fire or if we are doing it by the effort of our strength it's called strange fire amen verse 2 and the lord said unto moses speak unto aaron thy brother let's try and follow very very carefully that he come not at all times into the holy place he's talking about the the, the holy of holy because aaron was the high priest as of them that he come not into the holy place within the veil, you know, that before the mercy seat, that he does not enter that place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark. The Lord described the thing very, very well. That he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall, now, this thing that we saw is spoken of in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7 to 15, and 25, and verse 25 to 28, you know, verse 20, okay, let's just read that very, very, very briefly, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, you know, just verse 7, in fact, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, and Paul here says, he says, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year. So it happens only once every year, not without blood. He did not enter that place without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So he entered there with blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, verse 3, we'll, we'll make it more clear. And Aaron shall come into the holy place with what? With a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Everyone shall come to the holy place with. Now, the high priest made atonement. Now that we know, it's very, we have made clear what that word atonement means. The high priest made atonement for himself first Amen. and for his family. And then he now also made the atonement for the children of Israel. So the one for himself was a young bullock and a ram, which is we see the uh, animal sacrifice in this picture. A young bullock for a sin offering and a yam, uh, sorry, and a ram. Hallelujah, not yam. <laughs> and then the one that he offered for the children of Israel, you know, was uh, uh, a goat, a goat, one goat and one ram also. But they they also got two goats. Now we are going to okay. Let's just proceed and we'll make it clear. We'll make it more clear. So he offered for himself and also for the children of, of Israel. 
Verse 4. Now he shall put on the holy linen coat. If we follow scriptures, we will see that any where we see that someone was putting on a linen garment, it was speaking of Jesus Christ. In Ezekiel 9, the judgment in Ezekiel 9, there was a man wearing a linen uh, garment, which was which was a, a figure of, of Jesus. And he shall put on a linen coat and shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. Verse 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel. Remember, in verse 3, he, has, he already has his own bull, his own bullock and his ram. That is for his own. Now, he will, for the children of Israel, he shall take of the children of Israel two kids of the goats. So they will bring two goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Now, the children of Israel will bring two goats for sin offering and one ram for burnt offering. Two goats. Two goats. Verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock. Now, we, we have uh, skipped. Remember, just bear in mind that two goats have been brought for the children of Israel. Two goats and one ram. Now, Aaron, remember, Aaron also has his own bullock and his own ram for his own of, for the one he will use to atone for himself and for his family. So we are not, they are not saying what he, uh, in verse 6, and Aaron shall offer his bullock for the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take of the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Amen. So we, we see here, like I, I put a diagram of the high priest casting lots on the goats. Now they will take a goat in Nigeria. We used to do. I don't know how they how they would do it, like uh, timbo timbo. But I don't know the uh, you know <laughs> the mini 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 mo. But they will cast lots for these two goats. One lot. When one goat is taken, one of that goats is going to be used for sin offering, sin offering, and these two goats represent, represent, you know, okay, the goat for the sin offering, amen. It shall, it is, it is represent, it represents, as we, okay, it is a representation of us. Praise, praise God. It's a representation of us as we, as we, you know, it, remember, we, we said that that word offering, it simply means an offering, you know, an offering up of something. Like our Lord Jesus Christ offered up himself, you know, praise God. So that God, it represents us, it also represents our Lord, you know, who offered up himself for sin, for us. But it also represents us offering our sins, coming to that altar because the goat for the sin offering was taken to the altar and it will be offered, will fall for the goat for the sin offering and one lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon the lot, upon which the lot's lot fell. So the goat that is for the Lord, Aaron shall bring that one and shall offer him for a sin offering, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him. So the scapegoat makes an atonement, amen, amen. and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. We would comment more on that. And Aaron, verse 11, shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself. Note that atonement cannot be made if there is no shedding of blood. It's only blood that brings, that makes an atonement, that brings us as, at peace with the Lord. So everyone shall take uh, uh, and shall make an atonement, verse 11, for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for, him, for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals and uh, of fire from the altar. Please put that, uh, um, that diagram. Amen. So when Aaron shall take his own, for, for a, his own bullock, remember two things. 
a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. That is for Aaron. For us, now, for the children of Israel, that was for the high priest because the high priest had to cleanse himself, had to make an atonement for himself. For the children of Israel, it is a goat for sin offering and a ram for burnt offering. That means leaving us with one other animal remaining, which is one other goat. Remember, there were two goats. There was a bull, a ram, one's place. Two goats, goat, goat, that they would take from the children of Israel to cast lot. That is one. And another ram, and another ram. Now, one goat is for sin offering for the children of Israel, and a ram for burnt offering. And the bullock is for sin offering for Aaron, and the ram is for burnt offering for him. And we left with one goat, which is the scapegoat, which was sent into the wilderness. Amen. So when Aaron has not taken this, he will not take his own bull for a sin offering and make an atonement. To make an atonement simply means that Aaron shall slay the bull, you know, on the altar. It's done here on this altar. It's done on this altar and shall... Uh, now... Verse 12, I was reading something in verse 12 for us to follow. And Aaron shall take a censer. He will now take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. Remember, this place is burning with fire. So he will take a censer and take some coals from this fire, from this place, you know, and he will now proceed into, into this uh, place. Okay, so go to verse 12. I just uh, did that for us to get a, a, a picture view. And... Um, and Aaron shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beating small, and bring it within the veil. Wait a minute. Okay. No, 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 sorry. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, amen. Please. Uh, our dad is in the house. Sorry, I think I have, I must have, um, I must have said, back to this verse 12. Everyone shall take a censer full of burning coals. Is that the altar of incense or the burnt, or the altar of, of burnt offering? Because I'm just seeing it here. It says, I take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. From the altar of incense. Okay. The golden altar of incense. Do I give it? Oh no, just really finish talking. Thank you. Hallelujah. So please go, go back. Go back to that. Revelation chapter eight. Okay. Revelation chapter eight. So, just going back so that we can be uh, very clear. Thank God I just saw that. Yeah, okay, if you look at Revelation chapter 8, so verse, verse 3. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. It says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given to him much incense, that he should offer it with prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne of God. Amen. Now, go, go, go to that diagram. So, the altar of incense before the Lord is this one. This is the golden altar of incense, which is before, before the throne of God. Amen. Which is before the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. So this is where Aaron actually takes that coal. But the fire actually used to light it is gotten from here. They take that fire to light this one. But on this day of atonement, Aaron goes to the holy place and he takes coals from here with a censer. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, let's go back there just for us to, to correct that. Verse 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. So, Aaron shall take that incense. Please go to that diagram. It's very necessary for us to really understand this. You know, Aaron shall take, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord. He will take that incense when we talk about burning incense, amen, before the Lord, he will take that incense and put it upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense, as the incense begins to, to burn, that the cloud of the incense 
may cover the mercy seat. Remember, there's a curtain here. So it goes up and it begins to enter here. It's like smoke. If fire is burning in a compartment here, and there's a little opening, it goes up and, you know, and it begins, the fumes begin to enter into the Holy of Holies. You know, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. The cloud of the incense must go and cover this place, you know, that Aaron die not. Now, throw a question briefly for, for us to answer. Why does the cloud of incense have to cover the mercy seat? Amen. Why does the cloud of incense have to cover the mercy seat? Because it says that not only when he takes this thing and he begins to burn it here, he should enter and cover the mercy seat. If not, Aaron, you know, uh, dies. Amen. Just throw a little bit about. And God, we know, we know one thing about, uh, we know one thing about incense, you know, is that incense, burning incense, anyway, it speaks about prayers. It speaks about the, the offering of, of our souls, you know, in prayers unto, um, unto the Lord. So we see in Revelation that the incense was used to speak about uh, 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 prayers. It says that the prayers of the saints came up to the Lord as incense. When you go to Chinese stores, don't, don't joke with them. You see people burning incense. That is Wi-Fi connection to their gods. And that is why it says that the order of our incense must not go out. It must not go out. It means when Jesus said pray without ceasing, he's, he's not joking with you. He said, these things are a figure. He's talking about pray. it must always go up. Hallelujah. One thing that comes to mind, you know me to try and answer the question. It says the cloud of that incense, that sweet incense must cover the mercy seat. You know, it says Jesus Christ, who is our high priest now, does what? He says he makes intercessions for us. So that is also a form of intercession, the role that Aaron is playing. Aaron was the high priest. They were high priests and they priest. Only high priests could enter inside that place. So Aaron, they, they are making intercession. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me just go back. Verse 14. Now, verse 14. After that, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his fingers upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his fingers seven times. Amen. Aaron shall now take the blood after he has offered up the incense unto the Lord. He will now take the blood and go inside the mercy seat. Please go back there. This is where we might stop. He will now take the blood and go inside the, the mercy seat and sprinkle this blood eastward, you know, and also sprinkle it seven times. So he's now remember that coming in from this, coming into this place, coming into this uh, structure, this you are coming in from the east. Hallelujah! You are coming in from the east, and you are going onto the the, the presence of God. If, if you look at the bearing of the tabernacle, this is the east. So the sprinkling the blood. One way that uh, is ministered unto me, sprinkling the uh, he's sprinkling the blood, looking towards the cross of the altar of Jesus Christ. He says he shall sprinkle the blood eastward. You know the 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 shedding of of the blood. Or rather, the sprinkling of blood, you know, where, or whether blood is gotten from, is from the cross of the Lord. So sprinkle it eastward, looking towards the altar, looking towards the cross, number one, and also looking towards the sinful Israelites, because that is where they are located, on the east. So he, he takes that blood and sprinkles it upon the mercy seat, upon the mercy seat eastward. And seven times, seven in itself, seven marks the finality of opposition and victory for the Lord's people. Seven speaks of a, when we talk about seven times, seven speaks of a finality. It's when something has been brought, you know, it speaks of complete victory. Okay, look at Joshua chapter 6. Look at Joshua chapter 6, verse 3. Where is Joshua now? Joshua chapter 6, verse 3. When they were going to fight against Jericho, you know, uh, verse 3 says, it says, And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shall 
thou do six days. He says six days they will keep on going round the city, you know, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horn, and seven and and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. So tell them to march around the city six times, and on the seventh day, march around that city seven times. And the priest shall blow the trumpet, and it shall come to pass that when they shall, when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when they shall hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up. Note, brethren, the wall of the city shall fall down and the people shall ascend up. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. So seven, on the seventh day, march seven times. And, and that seven march, blow the trumpet. And there will be a complete crumbling of sin, a complete crumbling of the, of of the flesh, God. every form. So it says he shall purify, he shall take that blood and sprinkle it seven times. Seven times. Because seven speaks of a finality of of opposition. It says that on the seventh day, the Lord rested. And rest is something that this day of atonement brings for us as we read further at another time. Even when you look at Psalm, Psalm chapter uh, Psalm 12, the book of Psalms chapter 12, you know, and we see the, the purifying of ourselves by the word of, of, of the Lord, Psalm 12 verse, that should be verse 6, verse 6, Psalm 12 verse, it says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Praise the name of the Lord. They are pure words, purifying us. You know, so when we talk about seven, it speaks of a final breakdown. It says, the city of this, the walls of this city, Jericho, at the seventh march, and that trumpet is blown, it shall crumble, and the people shall ascend. Praise the name of the Lord, and take hold of that city and conquer that, that, that land. Jericho was in the promised land. Yes. Jericho was in the promised land. You know, so that was the land that was given to them for a, a, a possession. And Jericho was one of the, the nations that the Lord delivered into the hands of Israel, which is a figure of us today. Praise God. So it says that Aaron shall sprinkle that blood eastward, looking towards the cross and looking towards the, 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 the people, and he shall sprinkle the blood seven times upon the mercy seat, marking a finality and an end of struggle and all the natures that are not aligned with the Lord in our lives. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And we cannot go further now because our time is, you know, is... Uh, is up. But there are so many other spiritual principles that we will get there. I can't say that we have completed this yet. Because we have not yet completed the day of atonement. So there are other, so many very serious principles that we need to, to take into consideration from verse 15 down. You know, which doesn't take time, but unfortunately our time is up now. You know, praise God. Hallelujah. There's something I wanted to say, but I've, I've I've lost it. Yeah. Amen. Well, it's okay. So we we would have to stop here. You know now. Uh, I I wouldn't have loved to stop half in this day of atonement. So I'm good to complete it. But we have to uh, uh, stop here now. But as we as we deal with it, please let's try. It's very good that as we started this day of atonement, it's good for us to finish it. For us to just get to get a, an understanding of what you know it is trying to do for us and what it uh, is trying to tell us amen but during the week i will advise us to read leviticus chapter 7 16 just read it during the week you know and when we come it will be it will be it will be easy for us it will be easier for us to go through it praise the name of the lord hallelujah amen. Amen. And take a look at it, and the Spirit of the Lord will explain to us what each of these things seem, uh, symbolizes. Because it's very important to not just know the history of this, but to also know how it applies to our lives today as Christians. Because if we don't understand how it applies to us today as Christians, then uh, it's just all 
head knowledge. It won't make much sense to us. Then the whole idea of dying, dying itself, bringing ourselves to the present altar will not be uh, uh, achieved. So please, and I think, and if you have questions, if you still do not understand, please, let's, we can always, we don't have, we're not in a hurry to finish these things. I really did not want us to be in a hurry. It's so important that we understand the tabernacle. So please, we can stop Chidera at any time and put up your hands and let me go back and explain again. But most importantly, it's not just a symbol, but explaining how it affects us in our Christian work today. That is to me very much more important. That is how clarity and understanding will come. If I can apply it to my present Christian work. So, you know, uh, we, I don't think we should be in a hurry with the brain altar. We can take it up again next week when we come back. And if you go and do your study, you can come up with questions. And then we can just take it up from there. I have a whole bunch of questions mm. I need to ask. Amen. Um, one thing to also do, like we said, is how it applies. You can. Yeah, you can picture it. This high priest, for example, in this picture here, applying blood on the mercy seat is a figure of what Jesus Christ has done and is doing for us. Yes. By his blood, he applies it on the mercy, the seat of mercy. Amen. It's by the Lord's mercy that we are alive. If, what, what reason do we have to be, to be alive or to be here? You know, Jesus Christ is in the heavens taking his own blood. Aaron was applying the blood of goats. Hebrews tell us that Jesus is applying his own blood, not the blood of goats. Aaron made atonement for himself. Jesus did not need to make any uh, 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 atonement for himself. Amen. You know, but he's, with his own blood in the heavens, applying the blood for on our behalf, making atonement for us on the mercy seat. That is what this represents. When we know this, we can stand strong. Even if we fall, even if we fall to an error, even if we fall to sin, yes. you know, Jesus, the, this blood is powerful. As the blood that Jesus is applying on behalf of us, you know, we can take root and take our bearing from that blood in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So, brother, we must know that our error, our error and our sin cannot topple, cannot change the saving hand of the Lord. Amen. Once the arm of the Lord has been outstretched, no error, your shortcoming cannot overcome it. Amen. It swallows it up. The outstretched arm of the like I said yesterday in, in our youth meeting, you know, and it was just the Lord just showed it to me. The outstretched arm of the Lord was shown in a figure when Moses li lifted up his rod, you know, and the Red Sea divided into two. Moses that was lifting up that rod, was he a, a perfect man? No. So Moses' error and shortcoming could not deter, could not stop the outstretched arm that was that, that is the arm of salvation. And the Red Sea was parted into two. Joshua, even when they were going to go and fight against this Jericho, the Lord said that when you lift up your no, is it Jericho? I think it was I, the city I. When you lift up your spear, he says, I shall deliver the city into your hands. Joshua was not a perfect man, but his shortcoming, his error could not change the the out the saving the outstretched arm of salvation of the Lord. So no error in us. Any weakness that we have before, it cannot topple once the arm of the Lord has been stretched out for salvation. You know that the Lord's arm has been stretched out towards us. His right hand is going to give him victory. And we are going to experience the fullness of the promises of the Lord on our lives, no matter the shortcoming that we have now. Whatever is the weak, even after here, you live here, and you, and you fall to a sin or you fall to any, it does not change it does the blood is being applied in the on, on the mercy seat it does not change the salvation of the lord all we need to do is submit ourselves on that altar and always come by the blood of, of jesus christ and his word concerning us does not drop to the ground so let us not don't feel yes. feel condemned or less that in any way the blood jesus is applying here is the same blood is applying for you is the same blood is applying for each and every one of us with the other the man that says he is a bishop high bishop or reverend this or pastor this is the same blood and we have the same privilege of of of, of eating of the promises of this blood that has been shed for us so this would be a figure of the lord jesus christ right now that we are living he's applying this blood on the mercy seat that we die not yeah. praise the name of the lord Hallelujah. Hallelujah. amen just begin.